The Celebration of Light is the largest public gathering in Western Canada and we wanted to be a part of such an incredible community event. As they have every summer for the past 29 years, the skies over English Bay played host to an enormous public spectacle. That was the scene from the water under the fireworks on July 27, 2019. In an era when so many people have their faces buried in their phones, I'm left wondering why so many people turn out to watch explosives go boom in the night sky. Does the celebration of light represent an element in modern society we are all craving? Well, that's what Ray Greenwood thinks when he says, we want to be a part of the community. We want to be a part of something. And it's been that way since the very first night. It's an interesting observation, one that is both local and global. Fireworks shows have attracted large audiences for longer than mobile devices have been ubiquitous. But why, in a digital world, are the audience numbers growing? Could it be that we yearn to rub shoulders with others? Feel the swell of emotion that a crowd of people creates? Do the fireworks force us to interact with one another? Do they create a focal point, a shared experience? As previous guest Eileen McManaman points out, major sporting events bring us together and at the same time promote inclusion, environmental awareness, and set examples. In the case of the fireworks, attendance is free, and that means even more people can participate. It also means the opportunity to champion ideas and concepts is magnified. For example, this year there's an emphasis on reducing the use of single-use plastics. The organizers are working with food vendors and encouraging them to offer alternatives. We invited Raymond Greenwood, the man who got the whole thing started, to join us for a conversation that matters about major city events, why they're good for the community, and how to make them happen. Conversations That Matter is a partner program for the Centre for Dialogue at Simon Fraser University. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. Raymond Greenwood, welcome. My pleasure to be here, Stu, today. You know, we're doing this kind of as a little bit of a special going into the last weekend of the fireworks. So we're a couple weeks in, in advance recording this. And I look at the fireworks, and normally I would say, well, why would that be a topic that fits in with the, this program? But I got thinking about the fact that uh, when we don't have uh, major events, and, and I can't really think of anything else in Vancouver that has the, the impact of the, of the fireworks that we now call the celebration of light, um, like there's nothing else quite like it. Let, let's go back to the you know the, the the beginning of this because you were instrumental in helping to create that and then let's then talk about the significance of, of why it's important that we continue to have events like this so where did the concept of the fireworks come from uh, and what year did it get started okay. in very good question so I emigrated to Vancouver in 1973 I then got involved in a fabulous organization called the JCs the Junior Chamber of Commerce we used to sponsor the salmon barbecue at English Bay. And we, if you remember, we had this huge amount of salmon. And we used to sell it oh, at yeah. four ninety nine. <laughs> yeah. You can remember a piece of salmon. It was a salmon. big event. Oh, yeah. it was a huge event. Yeah. And it was part of the Greater Vancouver Sea Festival. Anyway, the Sea Festival went bankrupt. Mm -hmm. So three of us decided to bring back the Sea Festival, and I became the chair of it. So I started buying fireworks. So I was buying fireworks, and I used to get Alex Di Cimbriani, the mayor within a city in the West End, he owned those beautiful Tudor black and white homes to sponsor it mm -hmm. for a grand total of three thousand mm -hmm. dollars. I then went to a guy called Bruce Sinis. I said, "Could you do a logo in fireworks, saying brought to you by X Y Z company?" And they told me no. I then went to a convention in Kelowna, and there was Red Devil Fireworks out of Tacoma, Washington. And they did these set pieces, a Canadian flag, a U.S. flag, all to music, and it rose up like this. And we actually went to Montreal. So you asked me where did it start? It actually started in 1984 
at La Ronde by a fellow called Frank Furtado. And he was a producer there at La Ronde. And he started this fireworks competition in 84. So we went there in 89, Stephanie and my wife, we said, this was wonderful. And it was a theater type fireworks, but the people were on the Jacques Cartier Bridge, the Molson's Building, Montreal. So people were gathered all around all to watch over. this. And it's just as you say, it's a way of bringing people together to bring in the whole city to an event. So l- let me just, uh, for a point of clarification, 1984, you're saying in, where was it? La, La-, La- Ronde, Montreal. In Montreal. Yeah. Was this the first that, that fireworks was... competition in Canada, Canada or the first fireworks competition? No, first fireworks, to my noise, competition in Canada. Yeah. And it was a follow-on to Expo 67 and then I believe the Olympics in mm-hmm. Montreal. And then it was a follow-on. And they were looking to do something to bring people down to La Ronde, which is like our peony in Vancouver. So we went there and we said, my... This is magnificent. We should have this in Vancouver. So I came back to Vancouver. I phoned, in actual fact, Benson and Hedges, Harold Thompson. I said, can we bring it to Vancouver? And unbeknown to me, he had already been here three years before, two years before, spoke to Gordon Campbell, the then mayor, and said, we want to bring this and we'll charge you, the city, a quarter of a million dollars. And Gordon said, absolutely not. All they ever gave to festivals at that time was a measly $500 to pay some of the city costs. So, so that was a no-win. So I came along, and lo and behold, I didn't do that. I never phoned Gordon. I got a whole group together at the English Bay Boathouse. We had discussions. We brought Frank Furtado in, and boom, the rest was history. We started in 1990. Oh, no, no, the rest wasn't history. Yes. <laughs> well, it wasn't that easy. You no, know it wasn't. Come on. How difficult was it to go from concept to actually getting uh, approval? Because, you know, you're getting Parks Board That's involved, right. you've got Vancouver Police, you've got a wide you've got the cities involved. There's so many different agencies. You must have run into a lot of problems. And then on top of that, the people were going, whoa, 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 That's a tobacco right. company sponsoring this? Like, forget it. That was the biggest <laughs> It was actually the tobaccos and it was the doctors without something or other who were deadly against tobacco sponsorship. They made an awful lot of fuss. In actual fact, the city, the police and everybody were all sort of in favor of it. And then actually we created the FEST committee where we brought all the people together from all the different agencies and we worked together. But I can tell you, it did get approved and we got approved for four nights because we used to do three nights of international fireworks, and then the grand finale on the last night. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you, on the first night, the police had a bird because there were so many people down there. It was so successful the very first night. They had no idea what was happening, and we had to regroup the next day. We didn't close off any of the streets at that time, they just shut down because of the people. People were climbing on the tops of buses and that type of things. But we never had a riot. We never had any problem. But we did have to have meetings right away and regroup for the next night and then the next night. But I could say that I probably had at any given time over 400,000 friends down at English Bay. <laughs> Got to get you to hang on for a second while we take a quick commercial break. We'll be right back. Conversations That Matter is brought to you by Audlem Brown, a client-focused investment firm that starts client relationships with straightforward conversations focused on you, your aspirations, and your investment priorities. Audlem Brown has been a supporter of Conversations That Matter from the day we started this show. Their only condition was that we provide a non-biased conversation with people from all sides of all sorts of issues. And of course, we couldn't produce this show without the support of Oh Boy Productions. If you're looking to produce a show like this one, I suggest you reach out to Oh Boy. They can help you produce it, and they can help you build your audience. And we also need your support. I ask you to please pledge $1 per show by going to conversationsthatmatter.tv slash donate, because those dollars add up and play an important role in helping us produce this show. Now, back to the show. How many people in that first year with the four nights do you think came out to see this brand new event? First night, it was probably 60, 80,000. The next night, the word got out because it takes three days to set up a show. It takes, first yeah. of all, 
when the barge came out into English Bay and then you had to work on it, setting it up for seven days. You'd shoot that show. The night crew would come on immediately. The show was finished and start cleaning it all up. And then the next day, the next country, seven to eight people would come on to get it all ready. And it all had to be ready by three days. And then another three days and then the grand finale. So it kept getting bigger, 100 and then maybe 150. And then the finale night, probably about 200,000 people. And of course, what is amazing and gratifying is the amount of people in all those uh, apartment buildings. I mean, I've sometimes thought the building would collapse <laughs> with the amount of people that were on the balconies and mm -hmm. the people on the roofs. I mean, how, you know, West End is a huge community and many, many people went up to the roof of their building to watch it, you know? Wow. So as this is unfolding, of course, you're, you're scrambling because you're having to stay on top of it. Uh, did you have any sense of what it was about this event that brought so many people out at that time. Because remember, you said 1990, it's four years after Expo 86 had closed down. And I remember Expo 86 would have a fireworks show every, every night. night. And then phew, nothing. Expo 86 was over and nothing was happening. Now all of a sudden, here's this big event. Was there a bit of a hangover from Expo 86 where people are going, well, this is something for us to rally behind uh, and, and get involved in, and, and, it's, and it's part of our community. Uh, was there that sense? There, there certainly was a hangover from the, the Expo down here. I mean, everybody loves fireworks. I mean, they go way, way, way back to when they were invented by the Chinese people. Why? What, what is the psychology behind this fascination with pyrotechnics? It, it's, a, it's a form of art. The Japanese are very, very big into uh, the art of fireworks. They do huge fireworks of 12-inch, 24-inch bombs that are handmade, and the chrysanthemums come out. I was just in Japan, actually, um, three years ago for a fireworks convention, and they put on marvelous shows. And it's actually considered an art, a form of art over there. It's not like we in Canada or in the States just blow it up. But it's a great celebration. You can celebrate your birthday. You can celebrate your anniversaries. You can certainly celebrate on Canada Day. If you're from back east, you celebrate Victoria Day for some reason. Mm. Uh, it's cottage country opens up. Huge amount of fires. St. Bastille Day, big fireworks shows. Um, New Year's Eve in, in Newfoundland, for some reason, they have huge fireworks shows. And, of course, it's really weird here in British Columbia, we do Halloween. I mean, why do we do Halloween? And I think it's a leftover from Guy Fawkes Night, mm -hmm. November the 5th. But we shoot off tons and tons of fireworks on, uh, on Halloween night. Yeah, but we also do uh, New Year's Eve. Yeah. And also July 1st. Correct. Um, Canada Day, which, of course, yeah. is huge. And they tell me, Hans Fireworks, Bruce Innes had the contract, I believe, when was it? Our centennial, 67? Mm -hmm. They actually flew fireworks. There were so many fireworks used, the government had to fly them across Canada to get them to the right places for July the 1st, because apparently... In 67, it was just a huge, huge, huge celebration. Yes, you know? it was. Yeah. I was here. You were here then? You remember <laughs> yeah, I that? remember it, yeah, of course. I, I gather it was It was fantastic. a very big deal. But you look at Canada Day here at the Canada Place. I mean, they actually stopped fireworks for three years because of the, the cost of the policing. Because yes. the policing was very expensive. And, and Bill Watson stopped it. And there was a great, I think his name was Councillor Farmer from... West Van, he formed the Barad Fireworks Society to bring back fireworks for uh, Canada Day. And now the port pays for it, and I believe West Van. And there's now two barges now on Canada Day shoot the shows, one here and one in Dunderraven. I mean, everybody loves fireworks. So what is it about a, a big event, especially like the Celebration of Light, with so many people coming together? What does it do for a city, uh, first of all, psychologically? Well, I think it brings a lot of people together. And I think one problem we have, in certainly in Vancouver, is all these empty homes on all over the where people don't know the neighbors anymore. So I think it brings together what used to give me great joy uh, I'd go down to English Bay about 2 o'clock in the afternoon on a fireworks day, and I'd see all these people setting up camps, you know, having their, having a party, having a picnics, all these families, and they'd bring friends in, and it, it 
became a huge tourist attraction as well, and it is to this day. I mean, mm-hmm. now of course there's the, it's the Honda Celebration of Light, and India's just performed, and then there's Canada and Croatia, which are very interesting choice and it brings countries out there's nothing nicer to see a whole group i remember when japan was edited people came out in kimonos i mean it was beautiful sight and then when mexican there they're all wearing the flags and the chanting and the dancing and it's amazing how everybody when the fireworks start they all sit down of course what is amazing now is the cellular phones the amount of lights that go on you see with these cameras and everybody's filming <laughs> when you, and when you see in the crowd all that <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> just, just amazing and but i think people are looking for things i mean we did have the indie in vancouver down around bc place yeah you saw watch them yeah. from your building um then there's the bard on the beach which of course is doing a superb job right. 30 years this year yeah christopher gaze has done that and what was the other event that so and then the fireworks was the the third event, you know. Well, and we do have the P and E as well. well. Let's P&E not forget the P and E. It's been going on for oh, more for than a hundred years. years. Yeah. Um, but these are the things that I think help to create a, uh, a collective consciousness within Co- the city. Correct. We get to know one another yeah. in ways that we don't, yeah. as you point out, get to see them, especially if we don't know who our neighbor yeah, is. That's right. And you just look at the VSO. I mean, they've proven it now. Uh, it's not a new thing because when I ran the Sea Festival, we had the Symphony on a Barge. But now, the other week, they were down at Sunset Beach, 14,000 people mm-hmm. down there watching the symphony. So people do want to come together. With this economy being a little bit tight for some people, they need free events. And that's probably the biggest benefit about the fireworks. It's free. Uh, it's free to it, attend, but uh, all of those merchants, and there's so many other services, Like, what is the economic spinoff? Well, we'd have to ask Tourism Vancouver, but when I ran it, Tourism Vancouver did a survey, and when I ran it up to 2011, it was $26 million. In economic? Economic benefit. Because you look at the hotels, you look at certainly the taxi service, transit, it's the busiest nights of the year with the uh, transit people. Um, You look at I once, I was very proud to have cruise ships out there, three I think five times I had cruise ships. One year, I had three of them out there. The Crystal Symphony, Holland America, and the Princess Cruises. Because they delayed their departure. They did, exactly. Yeah. They loved it. I mean, what could be nicer than giving, what, 2,000 people a free quarter of a million dollar fireworks show? Just say, here, off you go to Alaska, but we'll send you off with a bang, first of all. You know? Wow. So... Uh, this, as I understand, uh, our fireworks in Vancouver now is the longest running offshore fireworks, uh, event in the world. Oh, it is. It certainly is. And it's the finest venue in the world to watch it. There is no other greater place. I mean, if you think all the way from second beach, third beach, all the way around English Bay, Kitts beach, all the way to Jericho up on 10th and Trimble, Anywhere in any apartment in the West End that's got some sort of a view, they can watch it. Well, you can watch Street it off the nor- from the North Shore like, as well. Exactly. People yeah. watch it on Cypress Hill. I know. It's uh, like, <laughs> it circles all around. Yeah, all, all the way around. I've watched it from Grouse. I have to tell you, though, we used to run an information line, and we would have 10 lines come into my house, and we did get some crazy questions. Could I go on the barge and set off the fireworks? Well... The answer is no, because in actual fact, that's a good point. On the barge, people might not realize this, but it's now all electronically fired. Yes. But there is a bunker there, and it's a very, very wide cement bunker where two guys stay in there just in case there's any technical difficulty. And once they hit the switch, that show goes off by itself. And there's nobody there, and they're just there for safety. And it's a Canadian man... Uh, called Patrick, who actually came here the very first year, who is the major producer of the the show now. Patrick out of Montreal. Roughly, what does it cost to put on a show like this? Well, that's a good question. If if I was contracted to do a Canada Day show of that magnitude, I'd probably say about $300,000 today. For one night? For one night. And we've got three nights yeah. here. Yeah. It's a... I, I don't know to take I'm not involved, but I'd say it's close to a $2 million event for sure, and plus some 
as well. A company called Brand Live organizes it on behalf of the Vancouver Fireworks Society, and um, definitely lots of money. And just for people to know, the citizens of Vancouver are the major sponsor of the event because the city pays. A guy called Brent McGregor, who you might have known, deputy city manager, he saved the fireworks in 20, 2001 when uh, the, liber- well, the government of the day should get political on your yeah. program, mm-hmm. decided to ban all tobacco sponsorship. They took out one week $60 million from tobacco sponsorship, from sponsorship, like mm-hmm. the Du Maurier Jazz yeah, Festival, yeah. the Du Maurier Stanley Park Theatre. It would never have been here today mm-hmm. if it hadn't been for Roberta Beiser that got a million dollars plus from Du Maurier to sponsor that theatre and all the other things that we had I think Damari Ballet mm-hmm. and Symphony was sponsored. He wiped it all out. Unfortunately, Mike Horsey, who used to run right. the convention center, he, right. him and I got together. We actually got BC Hydro gave us a check, and then Carol Taylor phoned um, Glenn, Glenn Martin Glenn at HSBC. She was on the board, yes, right. and he saved it. So it became the HSBC. Celebration of Light, and now it's gone to be the Honda Celebration of Light. And the city of Vancouver stepped up to city, also uh, yeah. cover off some of those costs. A lot, a lot of the costs. Yeah. A, a, lot, a lot of the costs. And I think we have to thank Judy Rogers and uh, Brent McGregor, who really stepped up to get it. And I think Kendall Bell was involved at that time. Well, when you think about the amount of economic activity, there's going to be a considerable amount of tax revenue that's going to come back to the city as well. And and overall, it's probably a a really good investment on behalf of the city. It's interesting that you say tax revenue. The answer is nothing comes back to the city. And it's actually a a fact. It goes to the provincial government on PST, and it goes to the federal government. And it is a major attraction. I was just in Whole Foods at 8th and Canby three days ago, and lo and behold, on the blackboard of the calendar, what's going on, there they've got the fireworks, they've got the name of the country, so everybody now celebrates it. And it's just the night before the Pride Parade, of course, Yeah. and so it's a huge celebration, you know? Yeah. And no, um, they should, and I mean, it's like, it gets me going, parking taxes. When I just parked outside today, I'm paying 29% Parking tax, twenty nine percent, and the city should get some. <laughs> okay, back. well that's something different, Ray. Thanks for Thank coming you. in and doing this. Can I, I wish everybody it. a booming evening? <laughs> a booming evening. Thank you.